the next thing on our agenda was the pay act and i don't think there's anything we really need to do about that i had sent out um some feelers about the fourteen hundred dollar one-time payment for um season uh session only staff and it got very complicated around um, all seasonal employees for the state and what they would be getting and my understanding is that session only staff in the legislature is going to get the 1.9 percent increase even though they don't normally get steps as such but they'll get the 1.9 um, so that's a little bit but it's not much but i was told that that was a a losing battle so um the the brian thank you madam chair I just want to make sure I understood what Senator Kitchell said in the All Senate Caucus. I think I do. She said that the 1400 has been taken out of the bill, I believe, and will appear in a separate bill. Is that not true? The yeah, the, the Pay Act is, is, is still in play. No, I, I don't, what, I thought that what she said was taken out was, um, not the 1400 but the um just the whole pay act she said is going to be added to this bill yes they're going to add they're just putting the pay act into the into the budget we don't have to right. pass it we don't have to do anything with it they're just going to take the pay act and put it in there i think they're having some discussions around the the 1400 dollars, but it was something else i thought that um that was put being put in a whole nother bill then perhaps um, i misunderstood no. senator kitchen uh, i i think brian she she was simply saying when we you asked about the pay act that she, that it's going to be in this bill but it hasn't been added yet but uh the i checked with luke and the i think the thing for the future is that uh, that each department needs to be able to review the pay act provision because uh, he never got a chance to review that pay act and Ledge Council never looked at it either. So in future, um, it would be really useful for the bodies that are experiencing the changes and the recommendations to be able to actually weigh in on them. Yeah, okay. well, and that would be a responsibility of the of the bodies that are dealing with them. Uh, well, I don't uh, know. Yes, but I, I, this happened at, and it came to Ledge Council as a fait accompli. There was no ability for anyone to weigh in on it. So the, I, I think that, it, you know, they should, <laughs> it should be reviewed by, by whoever, you know, <coughs> The bodies that that are experiencing the effect should be reviewing it. So we'll we can. I don't want to get into a prolonged discussion about that now because we won't do another pay act for a while. Um, but when we do another pay act, we will um, make sure that everybody weighs in. If any of us are here to do it. Correct. But um, so I think that they. I mean, they'll have to deal with the pay act in as they deal with all other budgetary issues. And we're recommending full funding of the pay act, I believe, because we right. agreed with it, but um, the now appropriations will do with it as they see fit. Okay, so I don't think we need to do anything more with the pay act. So, that brings us to, oh, we're only 11 minutes late. That's not bad. Not bad. My internet oh, is still having- Oh, I know what it was. What, Allison? My internet is still having a problem, which is very frustrating. And that reminds me of one of the things that Jane did say this morning that would be in a completely separate act, and that was the broadband issue right. that um, right. Randy brought up, that there was nothing in the budget 
about broadband and that that is in a whole separate bill. Right. Okay. All right. That's so the RF bill that's coming from the house. Yes. So um, today we thought we would talk on our and I did committee members get the note that I sent out to you about feeling overwhelmed. Yes. No, I haven't seen it yet. When did you send it? Uh, Sunday. She was too overwhelmed to find it. I was. <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't see it. I, I'm mm -hmm. feeling exact same way. So I, I do think that this is a, if we look at this whole thing as a very broad issue that it is overwhelming, but I think that there are things that we've done in the past around and, and this kind of conflates two issues that um, are important to, to all of us. And one is um, bias and race relations and the other is law enforcement. And this, they are somewhat separate issues but they're conflated here and they're coming together. And I think that we, we can make some differences. We don't have to, we won't ever do as much as everybody wants us to do but I think we can make some real differences here. And some of the things that we've talked about so far, I think can do that. And some of the things that we've already done can do that. So what I was hoping today we would talk about was kind of uh, recruitment, training, hiring, promotion, all of that. And so um, I, I don't know who all we have here. I see Charity's smiling face, I see Curtis Reed, Michael Sherling, Diana Wally, um, Julio Thompson, Curtis Gwynn, Matt Birmingham, and Senator Clarkson, Clarkson way at the end on her little phone. And Mark my little phone Anderson. Try figuring it out again. Okay. So today I thought we would um, start looking at this and knowing that we won't always get to everybody who's um, on, been invited or on the list, but um, the way we've been doing this, for those of you who haven't been with us up to this point is, we're looking at this whole kind of uh, issue that, that has two, well, probably more than two, but two main components here. One is kind of, race issues and bias issues. And the other one is law enforcement. And the, in this particular moment there, they have kind of been conflated. And we don't, we want, don't wanna lose sight of either of them. And we also wanna try and deal with how they are coming together here. So what we've been doing is um, looking at, um, last time we, um, addressed some of the, um, I can't even, I can't even think anymore, but improper conduct issues and um, disciplining and the penalties and that. And now today we're looking at uh, recruiting, hiring, training, that as an issue. And um, so what we've been doing is asking Betsy to kind of go through a a review of where we are on the particular issue. And then we're all keeping really good notes. And hopefully by the end of the week, we can come up with some ideas that could fit into some kind of a bill. And we're not exactly sure what that's gonna look like or where, how it will be, um, if it's going to be along with judiciary or that's for um, better minds than mine to, figure out so but that's that's what we've been doing and and we're have not uh well let's just jump into it so uh do, committee does anybody else have anything they want to throw in here right now before we get started no. okay so betsy ann if you would just kind of give us a brief overview of where we are with training and recruitment and all Okay. Hello, for the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. 
And I've been working on putting together a handout for the committee that lays out the information more clearly, but I just, I don't have that ready for you today. I'm just adding on to that handout that I provided last time. Um, so I'll follow up with um, a further overview. But a few things to mention um, in regard to recruitment, hiring, training, and promotion. Um, first, I'll just note, we already know the Criminal Justice Training Council is the entity that uh, sets the training requirements for law enforcement officers and provides training to law enforcement officers and then certifies officers that meet the training requirements. And there are, um, the council has rulemaking authority to establish what training is required for law enforcement officers. And so, for example, uh, the council establishes different training requirements for a level two officer, which has the middle ground scope of practice, versus the level three uh, certified officers who have full law enforcement authority. So there's differences in that training. Um, in order to actually be certified as an officer, an officer has to be employed by a law enforcement agency. So probably would make sense to hear from some of the law enforcement officers themselves about how this works in practice. But um, as I understand it, you, in order to be certified, you have to have someone who's willing to employ you, a law enforcement agency, be it one of our municipal police departments or one of our state uh, police offices, such as the Vermont State Police. Although the council has rulemaking authority to establish the training requirements for our law enforcement officers, statute does require officers to have specific training in certain areas. And some of those areas are anti-bias training um, that is required by 20 BSA 2358, which sets out the um, levels of certification, but it requires officers to, in subsection E, uh, have in order to, um, there was a date at the end of 2018 where all law enforcement officers had to receive a minimum of four hours of anti-bias training and training on a fair and impartial policing policy that's used by their agency. And then in order to remain certified, law enforcement officers are required to receive a refresher course on this anti-bias training and fair and, fair and impartial policing um, that's approved by the council and in every odd numbered year. So they get it every other year in order to be uh, remain certified. There's an, also a specific requirement for officers to receive domestic violence training once every two years. That's 20 BSA 2365. Um, as part of basic training, officers also, that basic training is what you need to take to get certified initially. There's search and rescue training. That's a requirement. Um, Basic training is also required to include animal cruelty response training. And then finally, another special training that statute uh, requires is training on the use of electronic control devices, also known as tasers, um, if an officer uh, will be using tasers. And that's 20 BSA 2367. Um, so those are some of the specific training requirements, but otherwise what that training looks like um, is established by the council. Um, as far as hiring goes, General Assembly already enacted the law that requires a potential hiring agency to contact the officer's former agency if the officer is no longer employed at that agency so that the potential hiring agency can learn um, the reason that the officer is no longer employed there. And then this committee in S-124 proposes to amend that law so that not only would a potential hiring agency need to contact a former agency, but the potential hiring agency would also now, under this proposed language, need to contact the officer's current agency if an officer still is employed at an agency. And that current agency, if it's in this state, 
would need to disclose its analysis of the officer's performance at that agency. So that is um, another step of learning more about an officer prior to hiring. As far as recruitment and promotion goes, I don't think there is that much in statute that really controls that. Um, there might be some language in the VSP statutes, but that's not applicable to all law enforcement officers. So it might be better to hear directly from officers and agencies directly on how they recruit and how they promote their officers. That's just a high level overview, uh, Madam Chair. I, um, are there any questions now up front or is, is there anything else that I can, um, more details that you'd like me to provide either now or come back with further info? You're muted, Madam Chair. Of course, thank you. Um, do we not also um, require mental health training in the basic? Because I think I, our sheriff used to be one of the mental health teachers. That does- Right, I, we did have mental health. There was, and, and, and while we're asking on, on that, what I thought we had specific training on de-escalation and stuff also. I, I, th I think that's part of the the basic training that happens as opposed to statutory requirements, but Betsy. Um, well, then, Madam Chair, it might make some sense for us before we do duplicative stuff like that, maybe it would be good to just run through what basic training in large, in a big picture way, what basic training actually encompasses. Right. So Madam Chair, I can, I can tell you in regard to the mental health, um, there is language that is part of the electronic control device statute, that's 20 VSA 2367, where in subsection E of that section, the council is required to coordinate its training initiatives with the Department of Mental Health related to law enforcement interventions. Um, training for joint law enforcement and mental health crisis team responses and enhanced capacity for mental health emergency responses. It looked like that was adopted um, as part of the uh, TASER language, the electronic control language. So right. maybe, the, maybe this is a question for um, Mark or I don't think the Chief Brickell is with us today, but Mark is part of the training council. So. To, to look at, give us kind of an overview of what's involved in the basic training, because I know we do use of force and de-escalation and that that's part of the training. So if you could just kind of give us that big overview. I would be happy to, Madam Chair. Thank you, Betsy. For the record, Mark Anderson, Wyndham County Sheriff. Uh, I want to uh, speak to two things. One is, is and I'm not sure, uh, Betsy Ann, if the language about mental health training uh, where it falls in statute, but we know it as Act 80 training. If that's the same as the taser, uh, uh, taser law, then uh, that's what it is. If not, it's been around for, for several years. Great. Um, to speak about uh, the training, uh, there's two levels of training. All training is uh, coordinated and uh, required by the, tr uh, the training council and the standards. The police academy is the delivery mechanism of that uh, on the training council's website. Uh, there is a uh, extensive and exhaustive uh, explanation of what level two and level three courses require. So I'm going to speak about level two briefly. Uh, level two is uh, what was previously known as part-time officers. Uh, part-time officers or level two certified officers uh, first undergo a two-week academy, which gives a basic intro to criminal law, motor vehicle law, uh, basic patrol procedures, uh, use of force, including uh, um, uh, compliant handcuffing and uh, firearms training uh, that upon completion of the entire uh, academy where uh, there's a variety of core uh, core courses that are um, built into it, uh, including ethics, uh, search and seizure, uh, constitutional law, things like that. Uh, they're then given what's called a provisional certification. 
that uh, during that time they undergo uh, uh, phase two uh, training, which is uh, in service uh, classes of which are required bloodborne pathogen training, crime scene investigation training, response to domestic violence, fair and impartial policing, fire extinguisher, first aid, hazardous material awareness, incident command structure, interacting with people experiencing mental health crisis, search and rescue, animal cruelty investigation, and then the uh, use of force tactics course, which is about a 40 hour long course, if I, if I recall correctly. Uh, there's also uh, the option for numerous uh, elective courses at the Academy's uh, choice and discretion. For example, my agency doesn't send people to Fish and Wildlife Enforcement, and I doubt that the Department of Motor Vehicles sends its uh, inspectors to uh, uh, how to transport a prisoner from jail to court, um, simply because of the nature and uh, unique operations of various agencies. Uh, so uh, there's a minimum requirement of uh, 50 hours. I'm sure many agencies establish the number of hours they need based on their operations. And then the uh, phase three portion of the program is uh, where they're doing on-job training with a certified, uh, not only a certified law enforcement officer, but a person who's also undergone the uh, training council's uh, field training officer school. Uh, that is a rigorous program with direct uh, observation and evaluation of a candidate on, uh, I think it's over 40 different uh, areas where they're evaluated. Those are based on a uh, uh, the San Jose field training model, uh, which provides not only standardization uh, on what the requirements and the grading uh, for a candidate would be, but also on uh, to provide feedback to, to uh, the candidate officer on what they need to be doing to be what we consider a solo officer. After all of that, uh, a packet is submitted to the Academy with the justifying documentation in which a, a finalized certification uh, or uh, non-provisional certification would be issued, and that person would then have a level two uh, certification and capable to enforce law. Then there's an annual, uh, under rule 13 of the, the training, council, uh, uh, training council rules, there's a mandatory in-service training requirement every year in which a variety of things that uh, Betsy Ann mentioned uh, become part of the necessary courses to maintain that certification. Failure to complete those courses would result in decertification or um, other avenues uh, based on unique circumstances. The second uh, training uh, or uh, basic training offered by the Academy is the Level 3 Academy, uh, formerly known as the Full-Time Academy. And that is an in-residence uh, 16 or 17 week long course. The only reason for the difference in lengths is if it's uh, offered in the spring versus the fall uh, because of holidays, uh, but it's the same number of hours regardless. Uh, that is um, a far more in depth uh, and resource intensive program, uh, which uh, includes not only uh, the, the uh, collegiate portion of training, but also uh, involves a variety of uh, physical fitness training and uh, what we refer to as a more paramilitary uh, training uh, methodology. Uh, that the, the list is too long to read, but uh, there's a total of approximately 800 hours for the, the minimum core instruction followed by another 124 uh, that most agencies take advantage of. But again, that's where we start to get into custom things. Um, I don't want to speak for any specific agencies, but one agency might say because like uh, maybe uh, the attorney general's office, an investigator associated with their office might not require DUI enforcement training, uh, whereas I won't require uh, the fish and wildlife certifications again because we don't enforce fish and wildlife law. We turn that over to the game wardens. Um, that, uh, within the, the 800 hours uh, or approximately 800 hours of training, uh, things such as motor vehicle law, criminal law, crash investigation, criminal law, responding to people with mental health, fair and impartial policing, uh, stress management, community policing, uh, defensive driving, firearms, uh, use of force, practical scenarios where they're applying the knowledge as they are learning it uh, is brought in and applied in a, a very uh, in-depth way. And uh, is that enough of a Top level view, view, Madam Chair. That that's helpful. Um, committee, do you have any questions? Uh, um, uh, so far, I, I do. 
You got okay. uh, Mark, is that articulated on the training council's website? So, because uh, you were going fairly fast, and it's uh, it, 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 it's a lot of material. Um, uh, uh, yes, Senator, it is. Uh, I will post a link to uh, to it in chat and for the people in YouTube world. It's the training council's website, which is uh, vcjtc slash from there you can dive into the level one level two and level three things uh, just for note uh, level one training is in law but is not codified in uh, any of the rules or curriculum of the academy so while it exists for a legal purpose we've never developed it and so to my the best of my understanding nobody in the state has ever been certified as a level one officer all right does anybody else um chris Yes, please. So uh, the question I have is, um, it's a, a bigger picture question, but I, you were running through an impressively, you know, condensed version of your curriculum, and I'm sure there's a lot packed in there. Um, I was listening to some discussions of, about training for law enforcement this weekend, and they were contrasting. Um, so I think we have 16 weeks here. Is that right, Sheriff Anderson? Right. And that... Um, so I'm not holding this up as a standard, just I'm wondering what your thoughts are. They were saying in Europe, you're generally go through training for two years. So, which seemed like a remarkably long period of time, but um, can you say something about, I know that we're talking about what's in it, but I'm also thinking about if, we, if the box always stays the same size, we're only gonna get to put one new thing in if we push something else out. Okay. So uh, I'm wondering if we need a bigger box to work in. The, uh, I think that's a, uh, in part a philosophical question to answer. Um, what is required, uh, having been to Europe uh, through, uh, through my military service and uh, interacting with police officers there just out of curiosity of how other systems work. Uh, one thing I have found uh, just through my conversations with them is that we operate in wholly different ways, uh, good, bad, and indifferent. Uh, there's just a significant uh, amount of difference in culture, uh, expectations of what the government provides versus what the, the uh, um, civilian public provides, uh, how all of those things work. Um, it also has a, a difference on selection, it has a difference on uh, methodology. Uh, to, uh, to the extent of your question though, uh, for how big does the box need to be, uh, it also comes uh, in with a different problem, which is as we make the box bigger, we make it even harder to accomplish uh, in hiring and recruiting. We've already uh, uh, witnessed uh, for several years difficulty in recruiting uh, and retaining people, uh, losing people to other agencies because sign on bonuses have become, uh, as uh, Senator uh, Clarkson will uh, reference, the poaching issue. Uh, so as we make that box bigger, uh, and I agree it raises the standard and uh, expectations, but as we make that box bigger, it also makes us uh, one step further in trying to get people onto the streets when we already don't have enough. The, uh, the requirements for uh, in-service training actually have uh, gotten, uh, gotten bigger. And one thing I like to know uh, is that uh, the numbers that I provided uh, are based on the Academy's uh, basic training. Uh, and the in-service training is the minimum requirement. I can't speak for all agencies in Vermont, but I know several who do go above and beyond the minimum requirements. Uh, even just speaking personally, my training record in many years, I was over 100 hours of in-service training uh, on any given year. And it's not to say like, hey, let's give me a pat on the back, but um, it's to say that uh, we do look at things in different ways. Uh, I think I've been somewhat vocal in uh, committee meetings uh, to state that as some of the, the mandates for these uh, trainings have uh, been required, it does start to push uh, things out of our training budget though. Uh, I made reference that we used to provide de-escalation training uh, before the non-lethal use of force uh, curriculum uh, was mandated on an annual basis. Now that it's mandated, it's, it is in part incorporated into the non-lethal use of force, but we were using far more in-depth techniques than what was taught under the required course. Another thing that's, uh, that I'll note is uh, one of the required uh, courses that we, uh, we uh, incorporate into the basic trainings uh, for level two, and I believe it's built into level three, 
is uh, search and rescue training, but the Department of Public Safety is the agency responsible for that. So why do I need to send a person to that? And again, situational awareness is important, but uh, as we try to apply a unified standard statewide, we start to isolate and uh, ignore local and regional issues. Uh, so I can say, hey, in Wyndham County, we have an opioid problem, but that's not necessarily as big of an issue in say Essex County. Well, I need to increase where Essex County might not. Uh, that being a problem, if I lose access to the control of the hours that I get to recognize as being county specific issues or regionally specific issues, then I, I, I mean, I only have so, so much resources to use. I think that if um, for people who don't know how it works, that when uh, Betsy Ann was talking about that you couldn't become certified as a law enforcement officer until you had an agency that had hired you. So an agency hires you and then they send, then they get you signed up to go to the academy and you go to the academy. Meanwhile, the agent, it isn't costing the agency anything to send you to the academy, but they have hired, it's not costing tuition costs. It's costing because they're paying your salary. And if you have, if, if you need 10 people and you're sending two people to the academy and you have to um, hire subs to fill in for those other two. So it is costing the agency some. So as Mark said, if you're talking about a 16 week period of time, that's four months of time. And if we expand, we could expand that. We could expand it to, there are people who would like to expand it way beyond that. Um, it means even more cost to whoever the municipality or the sheriff's office is that is um, hiring the, the person. Um, and we've heard, uh, for those of you who uh, haven't heard this yet, I'm sure you all have, but we heard that there is, um, need to look at the way we provide the training, not, not just what it is we provide, but how we provide it. Um, can some of it be online? Does it all have to be 16 uh, residential weeks? Can some of it be more regional? Can we have um, more intensified regional classes on say mental health or de-escalation or whatever those issues are? So um, does anybody on the committee have any questions right now for Mark or Betsy Ann? But, uh, <laughs> I can't see anybody, so I'm, I'm just gonna ask. It, may I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> Mark, at any point uh, in this 16 weeks, and I've forgotten what it, the cost is uh, for the first 16 weeks, but I know it's fairly substantial. Uh, so if you could remind us of the cost, that's one question. But the other question is, at any point, are there personality tests uh, taken by uh, by officers? I mean, is, it, is there any point at which they are, their, their compatibility, their, their personality, and their, where we sync up their skills and interests? So they may be interested, but actually maybe they don't have a personality that, that, that really is uh, conducive to policing and that is there is there any point at which people say uh, thank you we're delighted you're interested but you we actually don't think you're uh, uh, you know police material sure so uh, I'll speak to my agency's hiring process which I think is mimicked uh, fairly consistently across Vermont law enforcement uh, for a person who is not currently certified has an interest the only way that they can go to uh, either level two or level three training is uh, through what we call sponsorship uh, by an agency, which I believe the committee's already referred to. Uh, you can't uh, self-sponsor yourself anymore. Many years ago, that was a possibility, but that's been eliminated. The, right. I, I... It starts with, uh, uh, once you apply to an agency, the agency then, uh, as a sponsor, uh, assists you in signing up to uh, take an entrance exam, which is designed to be a 10th grade equivalency uh, test. Uh, I will note that the training council is in the process of evaluating not only its entrance exam, uh, but also uh, the MMPI, which is psycholo uh, psychological. Uh, but those are the first two steps of the process. If you don't pass the minimum score uh, for the entrance test, you don't move on to any, any further in the process. Uh, 
the belief is that if you can pass that test, then you're going to be able to uh, take in the knowledge that's delivered through the academy. The MMPI uh, uh, it is uh, to, or effectively it's uh, implemented uh, by uh, psychologists. Uh, Dr. Bertol, uh, who he uh, and his associates had a database where uh, the results of the, the MMPI are put into it and compared against current and past uh, Vermont law enforcement, as well as including uh, the results and the expectations of their careers. Uh, so for example, my MMPI would be used to evaluate uh, somebody coming in today uh, with a, a belief that based on my psychological uh, inventory uh, as a person who has become an agency head, uh, that might have a similar trajectory for someone with a similar uh, uh, result. Uh, not to say it's a, a crystal ball, but uh, that's what's used. It also evaluates uh, psychological risk, uh, including uh, if a person might have a mental illness, might be prone to uh, uh, a variety of issues uh, on a mental health level. So that is, those are the first two steps. Following that, uh, most agencies use either an interview process or an oral board process. I think that's where you'll probably see the most variance uh, among agencies. Some involve community members, some involve select boards, some involve uh, just uh, agency staff, whoever it may be. Uh, and so that would be a, a qualifying interview, so to speak. Uh, following that, uh, it's then a background investigation, which is then confirmed through a polygraph. The polygraph is required by the academy within, I believe it's six months uh, to entry. Uh, so we have a fairly close window to when the training will begin. And then we have the uh, basic training, uh, which uh, accomplishes whichever the level two or level three program requires. And then most agencies, uh, I assume all agencies, but I don't know for sure, have uh, will provide a field training uh, program where it's one-on-one -on -one direct uh, supervision uh, where they deliver the training to that, that candidate. It's all part of a probationary process. So if they're not, uh, if they're not acting appropriately, if they're abusing their power, uh, if they are simply just not understanding uh, everything that's been delivered, they can't apply with the knowledge to the road, uh, then they could uh, be dismissed without cause. Uh, so the entire training process all the way to their uh, certified cut loose and their solo officer now, uh, that's pretty much an entire hiring process and field training is considered part of the hiring process. So I'm going to, um, a couple things, I'm gonna ask uh, Commissioner Sherling to talk just a little bit about his suggestion about um, uh, testing. And I, Gail, did you uh, post the, the list of questions that I had for today? It went out in the email invite, but- But it's not, not could, could you post that so that I can see what I, what I said? Sure, I'll be happy okay. to do that. Because there were some issues in there. And then um, the other thing I'm going to say is, um, uh, just be careful about the MMPI. MMPI stands for Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. And um, when I was a college freshman in um, Iowa, everybody had to take the MMPI and I failed. So <laughs> I'm not sure what that says about me or about the MMPI, but um, I, I thought it was one of the worst things I'd ever done. Um, anyway. Yeah. Uh, I, I do um, want to be clear that our uh, the uh, council's uh, implementation of the MMPI is not uh, truly the MMPI, uh, which is used in a variety of, uh, of areas. And pass and fail are, I, th I can't tell you what that is. I defer to a psychologist. But what I do want to say is that uh, we're somewhat unique in that the pool that the MMPIs are evaluated against are current and pr uh, former Vermont law enforcement have either succeeded or failed. So we consider it on a slightly different population and pool, which is a deviation. Right. Well, I didn't really fail, but they almost reconsidered their um, whether they wanted to admit, admit me to a free um, state college or not. So, <laughs> um, so before, but, uh, Jeanette, may I just ask yes. Mark? Before we move to, to Michael, uh, Mark, do you ha actually have that whole uh, 
process that you just outlined, uh, do you have that sort of graphed out for people to understand what, do you know what I mean? Um, you, you, I think I understand what you mean, uh, but I will be quick in case it's wrong. I mean, do you have a roadmap of it written down or illustrated in some fashion? We do. It's on our it's on our application that explains all the steps. And I'll tell you, uh, in my experience, the number of people who read that uh, don't comprehend it. Uh, not, not, okay. I'm not sure if they're actually uh, after they pass the entrance exam, uh, which we explain in depth. Uh, after that, we then explain the whole process uh, directly to them as well. So we try to give it both in writing as well as verbally. <laughs> So, um, Mike, I, um, Commissioner Sherling, I know that, uh, let's see, um, I was waiting to see if this got posted yet, but um, there were some questions in there that had been raised and the questions I put in there that I really wanted us to kind of look at today in terms of this whole conversation those those questions that were posed or not questions they were suggestions that came from many different sources and some of them actually came from the commissioner so um and i know that one of them was um around uh um testing and making and not just um ruling out not just looking for uh, qualities that we don't want in police officers, but looking for qualities that we do want. So, Commissioner, if you could just uh, talk about that a little bit, and then I'd like to go to um, Curtis and Diana and Julio and um, for some comments. I think uh, I think you largely covered that uh, portion, Madam Chair. Uh, what, what we're suggesting is a variety of updates to the to, to statewide hiring practice. Again, important to note that what we're suggesting is that there needs to be a, a universal process, not a set of suggestions, not a model that people can work from, but that we have to be weeding in and weeding out candidates on a statewide basis using the same criteria. Um, for both desirable and undesirable uh, characteristics. Uh, but also that we need to update, um, you know, model questions and selection criteria for uh, a variety of the different components that the sheriff spoke to. So what should oral interviews consist of? Uh, what should the in written entrance exam uh, look like? It needs to be updated. Um, is there an update? Uh, we've taken a run at this a couple of times and haven't been successful in finding an updated psychological inventory to replace the MMPI. Um, but we do believe it, it is, is time to do that. Um, those efforts go back uh, you know, 15 or more years uh, in Burlington. We, we took a run at this and uh, it's not as easy as it sounds, unfortunately, but we do need to, to work on that. Uh, update the question bank for polygraph examinations. Um, ensure that background investigations are hitting on the same topics so that it's not sort of a free-for-all in what a background investigator might ask, but that there are core topics similar to having um, core skills and abilities that we need in, in folks. Um, we should be uh, looking to identify uh, key things and to rule in or to rule out candidates in background investigations. Um, ensure that we've got a community-based evaluation that goes with this, a, a, another uh, one of many opportunities to engage the community and in part have the community drive um, who's getting into law enforcement. Um, and, uh, and then finally, as uh, has been mentioned, um, ensure that there is a full disclosure of any prior performance or disciplinary problems and that we're, uh, we're cutting through any uh, legal red tape that may uh, exist in someone's past that uh, uh, has them subject to a non-disclosure agreement. If they're subject to a non-disclosure agreement, that should be a red flag in and of itself. You can't proceed in the process if there's something that's so egregious that you can't talk about it. Thanks. Um, one of the things I would um, would throw out there is the uh, kind of taking into account cultural differences when um, we're looking at uh, recruiting and training people. And the, the example that was given to me was um, 
by a new American in Burlington who really wanted to become a police officer and he probably would have done very well and um, was a good candidate, but when um, given the written exam, there were there was a scenario and then there were like five responses and which was the correct response that where how were you supposed to act and the the English was not his first language and the the um, differences were so subtle in the five approaches that he, he was confused by which one because English is a very complicated and sometimes um, hard to understand uh, language when we use jury both to mean partially done on um, sea vessels and jury to um, judge us in a crime. So we're, we have a hard language to understand. So just taking into account cultural differences and language differences, I think is important. That's a, that's a great point, Madam Chair. And many of the strategies here, well, I think uh, in our haste, we failed to actually call that out as one of the outcomes we're looking for. Many of these strategies are designed uh, to assist with uh, achieving that outcome. Good. Thank you. Any questions for the commissioner? Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, commissioner, I just wondered, there are Vermont uh, higher uh, education institutions that feature criminal justice as a uh, you know, majors. How many, well, let me ask it this way. I assume you're looking at some of the ones, uh, some of the folks that graduate from the Vermont institutions as well as from out of state, correct? Yes, and you bring up a, a great point that um, historically, uh, if you go back a couple of decades, a lot of uh, law enforcement recruitment was done from uh, folks that had military background. And then we migrated to folks that had uh, criminal justice degrees. And we have, uh, over the years, really embraced a much wider array of backgrounds uh, and educational uh, um, areas of specialization. Because, you know, it's, it sounds like a cliche when you say diverse organizations produce better results, but they absolutely do. Studies say that over and over again. And we're talking about uh, diversity here relative to race, ethnicity, uh, cultural background, but it also applies to uh, gender, to you know, what's your experience, what part of the country you're from, what your educational background is, just g diversity with a, a all in capital letters. The more diverse the workforce, the better results we're going to get uh, across the board. So, we, are, we do not only look at folks that have criminal justice backgrounds. Um, I would it, actually, when I talk to folks that are earlier in their um, education, whether they're in, in uh, grade school sometimes, junior high school, high school, I actually tell people don't go study criminal justice. And the reason is the academy will train you with the basics of what you need to know. There are many other things you can learn that you can bring to bear in a public safety career that are uh, equally, in some cases, more helpful to bring than criminal justice. Now, that said, we're also in favor of looking in the future at alternative training methodologies that could allow for uh, two or four year programs to produce a certified officer to obviate the need to go to a residential academy except for a few you know, key things that you can't get in a collegiate environment. So I know it sounds like two sides to, to different coins, but it's actually two sides to the same coin. It goes to that diversity of training, diversity of uh, the types of people we're getting into the career uh, and really widening that lens um, beyond many of the things we typically talk about when we talk about uh, this topic. Do you have a sense, Commissioner, of how many Vermonters versus out-of-state folks get hired? Uh, I know the Colonel's on and I'm gonna take a stab that it is roughly 50-50 our retention rates for Vermonters are much higher than they are for folks out of state. Thank you. That is, that is accurate, Commissioner, on both. Thanks, Carl. Do, do you think most people um, hire in the, for local offices in the communities where they were from? 
I mean, I'm, I'm just curious. I don't know. No, uh, that's actually pretty difficult here in Vermont because of our demographic challenges. Oh. Okay, I just wondered. So, um, uh, anybody else have a Curtis, Diana, um, Julio? Would you like to weigh in on? I'll, and I know this sounds like this is kind of um, not very focused, but uh, we have a lot of good, really note takers and we're keeping pretty good notes. And when we start to pull this all together, there will be something positive to come from it, I promise. There's something positive that's already come from it. So <laughs> good. Great. So am I on? Yep, you are. Right. Thanks. Okay. For the record, uh, my name is Curtis Free Jr. I'm Executive Director of Vermont Partnership for Fairness and Diversity. Uh, I'm also the chair of the Vermont State Advisory Committee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, and most importantly, I'm a father of three children, of which my daughter, who graduated from Occidental on Sunday, uh, <laughs> in the area of critical theory and social justice, graduated summa cum laude. Oh, well, great. Congratulations. Good. Oh. All right, now to the business at hand. <laughs> Curtis, that's fabulous. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, the, uh, the, the, the challenge before you from my vantage point is there are 50 different law enforcement agencies across the state of Vermont that have each developed its own culture and uh, oftentimes there's no uniform uh, standard or practice uh, and it's 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 like the wild west and and, and so I, I I believe that over time and maybe this might be the time to begin to address that is getting everyone <clears throat> under the same tent um, with either use of force practices, with, you know, motor vehicle stops. I mean, I, I am still encountering local law enforcement when I, when I get stopped to say, do you know why I pulled you over? As opposed to, and I'm not saying how often I get pulled over, <laughs> but when I get pulled over by a state trooper, uh, it's always introduce themselves to tell me exactly why they pulled me over. Then they ask me, is there a reason for that? So it sends out an entirely different message in terms of maintaining one's dignity. Um, and it, it doesn't start you off on this sort of narcissistic downward spiral. Um, there are, so what I see is an overarching um, vision for state law enforcement is that um, bit by bit, it gets consolidated so that everyone is operating off the same book and on the same page. And that currently is not, not what happened. That's <clears throat> um, I'm going to take a quick issue with the idea that diversity alone, and, and, and I'm, I am, uh, I might be bastardizing the, the commissioner's uh, statement here about diversity in the workplace produces better results. Diversity alone does not produce better results. You can have a diverse workforce, but if the workplace is toxic, you're not going to get better results. If the workplace is not inclusive, if it's not equitable, if everyone doesn't feel as though they have a stake in the outcomes, the positive outcomes, then you know, we're not going to find ourselves um, with better decision making. Uh, the three top issues um, within the context of you know, how do we bring all law enforcement into the same book, onto the same book. Um, and these are not necessarily in, in order, but the first is, is um, 
where the training council is located. Right now, the training council reports to no one. Uh, it is freestanding, it's independent. Um, it is, you know, a, a body that looks upon itself, but there's no external um, political pressure for it to change. Um, and, and so, you know, I'd like to see the, the training council in the executive branch in some form or fashion, whether it is secretary of administration, whether it's under an expanded public safety uh, department or, or division, um, but that there needs to be someone with their, with their um, hands on the lever that would, uh, I think, ultimately improve the product that the training council certainly provides at, at, the, uh, at the police academy. The second involves um, looking at citizen review, citizen over, oversight, um, that there again, we, we have the, the challenge if each municipality creates its own uh, civilian review board um, imbued with the powers given to it by a local select board, you end up with 50 different um, models for uh, how citizens are um, reviewing uh, and uh, involved in, in oversight. So I would strongly argue for a common set of, of um, practices, uh, regulations governing uh, civilian um, review boards. And, and I'm going to split the hair between community advisory boards and community review boards. Review boards have the teeth to be able to overturn a decision by the chief. If the, if the chief, you know, um, if there's an officer <clears throat> uh, who's involved in some sort of misconduct and the chief simply decides to give that officer a, a slap on the wrist, uh, but Citizen Review Board says, no, uh, the infraction is, uh, really requires much more of, of um, a disp disciplinary action. Um, so making sure that civilian review boards have the teeth to be able to do their jobs, but at the same time, making sure that their policies and procedures and standards are uniform as opposed to... Um, you know, having a hodgepodge of, of um, a hodgepodge of, of, of boards that uh, sort of reflect our inability to really pull together uh, under a unified, same book, same page. Um, and then the, um, the third area is what do we do when uh, an officer has been um, fired or relieved of duty due to some sort of misconduct. Um, I think it ought to be non-negotiable that that officer is immediately decertified uh, and is barred from you know, position, position in law enforcement uh, within the state of Vermont. So those are my three, my three issues that that I believe you should tackle, um, but understanding that the first overarching of, you know, how do we pull these 50 plus law enforcement agencies into the same book and onto the same page uh, in terms of standards, in terms of training, in terms of recruitment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So I have a couple questions and then committee, I'm sure you have some questions. So thank you, Curtis. Um, so I, I, um, I'm not going to comment on the location of the training council because I've had that question for some time, and I think we've talked about in the, that in this committee before, and and um, I think it's not the end of the conversation. No. Um, my the two questions I have was, um, would you 
in terms of a community review board, would you see each community having one or would you see them somehow being more regional or that kind of uh, take the, the immediacy, the personality, you know, the, the immediate personal contact out of, make it a little bit farther mm -hmm. away. And then the other question is around the decertification. I think I missed something there, but if you're, are you saying that if, if a police officer is sanctioned for any offense, that they should be immediately certified or would it depend on the, the offense because they could be, they could be sanctioned by um, being without pay for a month on leave because of a minor infraction, but. No, if, if, if they were fired. If they, oh. were fired, if they were fired for misconduct. Right. Oh, oh, but I heard, that's what I heard you say. Okay, I, I, I think I missed that. Um, okay, I was thinking about this community review board when you started on that, so. Right, no, no, um, only, 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 only if, if they are fired. Okay, so would you comment on the community review board on kind of where, what level you see that as? Uh, I would opt for regional only because it fits more squarely in the idea of, you know, how do we bring as many folks under the same tent? Mm -hmm. And, you know, could limit it to five or, or you know, an odd number of five or seven members. Um, and, you know, Wyndham County, we have 23 towns. Uh, and so that those would be rotated over time. So that, you know, every town or seven towns would send a representative mm -hmm. And uh, terms would be staggered, um, and so that you know you would have that sort of institutional memory um, that that would be there, and and that we would invest the the time and training, the the, the, the funds and training, um, to really make that the sort of transparent body that residents deserve and that res residents uh, are really clamoring for. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a, uh, and, and, you know, as a review board, they would have access to internal affairs, they have access to uh, all information relative to the, um, you know, to a critical incident uh, in, involving an officer and a citizen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Allison, did you have a question? Yeah, I do, Kurt. It's just to follow up on that, because um, I, I, I think a regional approach would be great and would build on what we're already trying to accomplish regionally with uh, public safety. Uh, how, do you have any examples of that working successfully now in the United States? Or anywhere, actually. It doesn't need to be just mm -hmm. in the United States, but it would, of course, be a little helpful to have any examples here. But do you have any examples of that? Not right off the top of my head, but I can get that to the committee. I think that would be helpful for us. Okay. Yeah. I think there is a, a, a national board and I can't think of what the, what it is, but I think Aton talked about it, but I can't remember if it was here in judiciary mm -hmm. that is a national board or maybe it was Julio that talked about it. It's a national board that works with with um, community review boards and community advisory boards. Was that you, Julio? Yes, it was. Oh. It's an attorney general's office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's called it, the National Association of Civilian Oversight and Law Enforcement. Yeah. We might be able to get some information from them on best practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and models, current existing models, because there wouldn't be this association if there weren't some civilian oversight, I mean, there's obviously some civilian oversight, it's just a question of the scale of it. How well, regional. I think, that, I, I think that's part of there. I think I mentioned Friday that there are uh, mm -hmm. different models and hybrids and some, some jurisdictions have two levels of civilian oversight and input. Some have uh, civilians that participate in policy making or setting uh, or training, revision or development. And then other ones that deal with uh, complaints or that may have a role in review of 
uh, uses of force of a particular sort. Um, there's a pretty broad variety. The other aspect of the, the, that association, NACOL, is that it provides training to uh, both online training and, and through conferences or webinars, uh, professionals who, who serve on those different sorts of bodies. They tailor their training to the different types of oversight models. Mm -hmm. and, and the name of the organization again is? It's called, the acronym is NACOL, N-A-C-O-L-E. It's the National Association of Civilian Oversight and Law Enforcement. I've, I'm a member and I've gone, I've trained at some uh, one of their conferences and I went to their last conference there right now, register. their next conference is online. It's in September, registration information just went out last week, I think. I can forward that to anyone who's okay. interested. Great, if, if you would do that. Chris? Um, uh, so good to see you again, Mr. Reed. Uh, question I had is about venue for um, these kinds of discussions. Hey, Josh. What? Um, and that is, uh, you know, I'm low on battery. Can you give me the charger? You know, wait for the battery situation to get sorted out there. Sure, sure. Um, the uh, no, so the one of the things we talked about last week was where do you get to ask these sorts of questions? Wh who's leading the meeting? How does the um, so that we make sure that the inquiries around um, you know behavior or something I guess that's in dispute or of concern that you don't in essence that it's uh, the discussion is led by someone who's a neutral party and that it's not in the building of any particular party to the discussion, you know, so that it, uh, simple example I used last week was if, the, if you, if the dispute was with a neighbor and you had to go to the neighbor's house to complain about it, it'd be a little awkward to show up at their house and have that discussion in their kitchen if they run the meeting. So, um, what's the what's the the counterpart to that situation here that seems like we'd want to avoid? Well, I think the uh, citizen review review board, uh, by its composition, uh, you know, they could rotate where they meet. Uh, they could be sort of centrally located in the in the uh, um, in the region, uh, you know, and and the, the community, yeah, you know, I think residents would need to have a vested interest in the transparency and the leadership of the of the uh, of their review board. Um, you know, the reason that we would have staggered terms so that you know not any one member begins to accumulate um, sort of quote unquote power, um, but that, you know, the, the, and you know, what this, what the state can do is, you know, lay forth, um, you know, sort of policies and procedures and standards for you know, operational standards that um, would minimize um, and enhance well, they would enhance transparency and enhance uh, trust and, and confidence um, as opposed to uh, distrust and lack of confidence. And sorry, I, I don't know the answer to this. I wish I did already, but um, are we already doing this in Vermont and doing it well someplace? The short answer is no. That it's not, it's not being done um, to a standard that I that that I would feel really comfortable with, um, and I think there's a lot of frustration on the part of of members of various police commissions uh, and or community communication uh, operations, um, citizen advisory boards because they feel like they don't have the teeth to be able to follow up and follow through with complaints coming in from citizens. Thank you. Yeah. Can you hear it, Madam Chair? 
Mark? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm just looking at uh, Title 20, uh, VSA 2403 and 2401, which refers to the civilian review process of internal investigations and fires. So admittedly, it's a little, uh, a little difficult to explain for a sheriff's department under current language. Uh, we've done our best to utilize the elected officials of select boards that we contract with. Uh, and I'm, so those are people who are, uh, as I understand it, people who are uh, empowered to review uh, investigations, uh, valid investigations conducted under an agency's internal affairs policy. And they also are empowered to uh, speak with the training council separately uh, from the agency, uh, which can ultimately compel decertification. So uh, I guess my question is what the gap is. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I misunderstood something. I, know, I only heard the last, every other word of the last sentence. Yeah, yeah. you weren't coming through very well. I'm going to try it without video. I think uh, Senator Clarkson's internet problems got pushed to Wyndham County. Yeah, yeah. The wind is flowing south. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm referencing Title 20, Sections 2401 and 2403. 2401 uh, defines what a civilian review committee is, uh, and it says that uh, they may be a select board or other elected or appointed body at least for the conduct required to be reported to the council under the, the sub, uh, sub chapter. Uh, I believe the committee is familiar with the unprofessional conduct and the triple whammies uh, and all, all of those things. And then under 2403, uh, it empowers both the agency head or separately the agency civilian review board, uh, the chair of the review board to approach the council uh, to discuss um, uh, and provide any documentation associated with it for the council's uh, ability uh, and processes. And through that mechanism, uh, with the council being ultimately a decertifying authority, uh, I guess my question is uh, what the gap is. Uh, is it potentially education? Is it process? Is, it, uh, is there something more to it that uh, we're not seeing on the basis? Uh, is this a, another compliance issue in terms of people don't understand how to comply. Uh, when I say people, I mean agency heads or the uh, chairs of the boards. Yes to all of the above. And, and Mark, what triggers the formation of that citizen uh, panel in Title 20? What, what's the triggering event that, or, or I, I, maybe that's the wrong question, but what causes the review to happen? Right, I mean, yeah. it's, it's episodic. So the, uh, that's actually a question and uh, potentially a gap uh, in, in the statute. Uh, we convene ours quarterly, assuming that we have uh, complaints to be reviewed. Um, one of the things uh, of most recent in my agency is we're looking to form less uh, to the, the extent of a civilian review for the purpose of internal investigations, but more for the purpose of uh, the regional input and uh, towards the development of our policies and procedures. Uh, one of the things that I've really, uh, I guess as a personal point, uh, come to terms with in the last three three to four weeks is how much we, uh, we haven't listened. Uh, and so uh, rather than try and uh, review all of my policies and say, I know best, I wanna bring in uh, many internal and external stakeholders to say, well, this is what uh, the effects of that policy is. Much like a committee brings in uh, various people, of different uh, professions, perspectives uh, to say that. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Betsy Ann. Hi. Um, so that civilian review board is a requirement because it's an element of each agency being required to adopt an effective internal affairs program. Um, this is in the council's unprofessional conduct subchapter that the sheriff was just citing from. And so this is in 20 VSA 2402. 
every agency is supposed to have an effective internal affairs program and then effective internal affairs program is defined to include uh, five different elements. And one of those elements is uh, having civilian review to uh, have civilians, which may be a select board or other elected or appointed body to review um, officer discipline, at least the discipline, the conduct that's required to be reported to the council. That's where that comes from. Right, and, and you know, in, in many communities, there's distrust between residents and, it's, and the select board. So that there's, you know, where residents feel shut out of the process. Uh, and so, you know, this would, would sort of put some daylight on a process that um, has been effectively closed uh, to residents. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, yeah. I guess I'd, I'd like to ask um, if that, if this, if we've created this, this civilian review board opportunity, why are so few people taking advantage of it? Why are there's so few of them that are set up and are being effective in Vermont. What's the barrier to their effectiveness? Um, I think <laughs> residents have a lack of lack of confidence in their ability in the ability of the of of a review board. Well, right now they're advisory boards. They're not review boards. They're established simply to advise the. Uh, the police department or the select board on policies and practices. So in other words, they don't necessarily have power. Correct. They have no power. Which makes it less exciting to be a part of. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess my question is, uh, they do have power uh, as permitted under 2403 section A2, which grants them the ability to essentially uh, open the door uh, to the cookie bar to the council. Um, so if an agency were looking to protect uh, and a review board felt that that was inappropriate, um, but an agency were looking to protect uh, an internal for political reasons, personal reasons, whatever it may be. Um, but let's just say uh, uh, in a, a grand sense that the a wrong reason, uh, the board is still able to access the council to say, this is the investigation, it was poorly conducted, or this is the investigation, it clearly shows misconduct, uh, and that conduct's defined under the unprofessional conduct, and uh, we think the council should act and act not only towards the officer involved, but also towards the agency head. I think that one of the, one of the other issues, and this may not be an issue, but um, we're small towns, and if, if, you're, if you're the small town of 8,000 people and you have a police department and you have a community, um, even if it was a community review board that had authority and power, that's, um, you know, in the legislature, we make decisions, but on a select board, you make decisions that you have to deal with the people every single day on in your community. I think it's much harder to be on a select board yeah. because of that. And and I think that um, if we're looking at each community having their own review board, that might be a mistake. We might we maybe should look at it at a broader level so that we have a countywide or a regional or um, five of them in the state or something like that so that it doesn't become so personal and so right. um, I, I think it's really, really hard to do that. And we had a, um, a Wyndham County caucus meeting this morning and one of our the guests that came and talked to us was on this very topic and talked about how um, you, you need to have the ability to review but at a higher level than just community by community because of the the interrelationships my my kid plays hockey with your kid and so what am i going to do i mean it's really hard so i think that's true well that's why the regional aspect is a good one 
Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would underscore that. I think that's the way to go if we're going to put teeth in these to, uh, to do it regionally. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I guess I'd also just want to know what the trigger is. I mean, it can't just be a complaint. There has to be something that rises to a level that uh, triggers their engagement. But, but you kind of want them engaged really on a whole host of things. Right. Uh, well, I think if, if they're truly a review board, they're going to, what I understood Curtis to say and Julio was that they would be reviewing decisions made by by the internal investigate or the internal affairs or whatever that's called is so that it, the complaint wouldn't come to them to investigate, but they would be reviewing the um, outcome of that and whether, whether the right decision was made, if it's a review board. Or, am I right about that? Uh, Julio? I might be heard on that, uh, Madam Chair. So um, not necessarily, there are models where a civilian entity is another place where complaints can be received. And under some schemes, that entity for certain types of complaints, they might be things like uh, unlawful stops or seizures, bias policing or, or harassment. In some, in some models, they have the authority to investigate those on their own uh, and either exclusively or in parallel with the department. In other cases, they would refer it to the department, uh, later on review the department's own investigation. And if they, like the Las Vegas model, for example, if they disagree or they think the investigation by the police department in Las Vegas uh, isn't sufficient, they have the authority under their uh, city ordinance to, um, to conduct their own hearing and call witnesses uh, make its own finding based on the hearing and then recommend discipline to the chief. In other cases, it's simply a review of the or the investigative file with a recommendation to the chief. Uh, and in other instances, it's an audit model where they look at a bunch of decisions and if they find flawed the investigative processes or procedures or inconsistent discipline, they may report that to the, you know, the applicable city government and, and then you know, ask the city council or the mayor or whoever the, um, the appointed authority is to make changes to systemic issues rather than you know, a case by case basis. And, and some cities have, you know, they have different, uh, some have an auditor and a board, some mm -hmm. auditor, a board and an ombudsman. It, you know, it's, there are many varieties. So I don't, I don't think, um, I don't want people to mistake to think that there's just one model where you you can investigate or you do investigate. There are really a lot of choices there. And NACOL, the organization, is this kind of clearinghouse where there are lots of those those different professionals who get together and, and talk with each other about, you know, carrying out their mandates. Mm -hmm. And this is where Go ahead. a large urban department might not work in a small rural state. Mm -hmm. Chris, did I see your hand? Uh, no. Oh. I, well, I moved it because I'm I'm taking notes. Okay. That was it. So, anybody else want to weigh in on any of these things, or any of the things we've talked about, or any of the things we haven't talked about yet? Um, well, Brian. Uh, oh. Brian, and then Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Curtis, you really hit, I think, on an extremely important uh, piece of this, and that's the communication, if you will, the initial contact that a citizen has with the law enforcement officer. And um, I, I just, I, I can't overemphasize how important that is. I have a real strong belief in the more able someone is to communicate with another person uh, the better the result is down the road. And I think you're absolutely 100% spot on with that um, contribution. And unfortunately, it is probably true that each time a citizen is pulled over by a law enforcement officer, it's not the same experience uh, for everyone. Um, there isn't any standard sort of, I don't believe, and, and certainly if I'm wrong, the commissioner or colonel 
or sheriff can jump in, but I've never been to the training academy, so I don't know. And I don't know how much time is spent on that really crucial aspect of how do you present yourself immediately to whoever it is that you pulled over. But um, it, it's really, really important. And um, so I'll just compliment you for, for pointing that out because I think all too often it's just something that we don't talk a lot about. We just assume that you get pulled over and they say, can I have your license registration and insurance card? But there's a way to do that that sets the tone for what might happen later on in that encounter. That's all. Um, and if, if you might add something there, you know, there's a difference between being able to train an officer and when that officer makes his or her way to the culture of the particular department that they're serving. There's a wide disparity of cultures in the law enforcement community. And where I have confidence in, in Vermont State Police, uh, I don't have that same level, level of confidence with a lot of the smaller uh, departments. Um, and, and, and part of that has to do with I want to say a culture of toxicity uh, where it's, it's not based on the humanity that we all share. Um, and which is why a long-term goal is really let's consolidate these, let's move them all in the same direction uh, and ensure that we're all operating off of the same, same, same page. Anthony, did you? Sure, I think I appreciate the fact that Curtis brought up the the review board and the lack of oversight of the training council. I think that's really important. And what you just said about toxicity in the local police forces, I mean, you could call it that, which is fine, but you could also hope that it's really a lack of education and about cultural awareness. And I want to go back to what with the discussion that we had with Mark. And it's not necessarily something that needs to be answered right now, but I was flipping through some of the curriculum for lack of a better way of putting it from the training council and I never saw like how many hours are spent on the cultural issues in the training council how many hours are spent on mental health and how many hours are meant are spent on some of the other things that I think are important for police to really master before they get licensed so I just wonder if there's a way at some point of being shown the, what the curriculum really looks like how many hours do I spend on mental health, and how many hours do I spend on cultural issues, how many hours do I spend on um, de-escalation, those kinds of things. I'm just curious where the balance is and how much time is given over to those different topics. I don't have to know that now, but I'm curious about it. Uh, Senator Polino, that is available under a heading under level three basic curriculum summary. Uh, okay. Short. Uh, fair and impartial policing receives uh, four hours. Uh, dealing with people with physical disabilities is two hours, uh, and I'm sure there's others, but uh, I'll also post a link into the chat. Okay, thanks. You know, one of, I was just thinking about when you were talking about cultural awareness that, so I grew up in a really little town, very farming community in way northern Minnesota. To, the, um, most, the only people who weren't Norwegian or Swede were a couple Polish people. So that's, that, that was my cult, that was the cultural awareness that I had. And so culturally I just think, diverse. Huh? And culturally diverse. Oh, very culturally diverse. Yeah. There were a few Danes there too. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, so I was just thinking in terms of how, how do we, make you you can't really teach cultural awareness i mean you can you can um teach it somewhat but you almost have to to experience it so i was thinking so if you have a a police officer that is being um hired by small town x and they go to the academy and they get their training and they are there with um a bunch of other people who are getting their training. And then they leave and they go out and they get their on the job training. If they go right back to that small town X, that's their 
cultural awareness. Maybe they should get some on the job training in Burlington or to, to, to see a different, to be aware of, of um, more differences. I, I, I don't know, I'm, this is a very ill thought out thought, but I, I just, until we, until we actually live in other places and experience other things, I think that te just teaching me about cultural awareness, um, it doesn't sink in until I'm actually confronted by it. And I don't know how we do that in, well, in that, this you know, instance. You're on to something very interesting, Jeanette. I, I, I think that uh, exchange programs within law enforcement uh, would be a very interesting thing for our Vermont police to go and spend uh, an, a significant exchange time with a, an urban police department. I mean, it would be that it would be eye opening if 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 nothing else. I mean, otherwise, people experience that only on television. I mean, they don't. You're right. An exchange of some variety might be a very interesting additional uh, aspect to all this. So, yeah, I don't, I don't uh, it's Mike Sherling. If uh, if you'd yeah. like, uh, Madam Chair, I can give you a little background on some of uh, okay. these efforts historically. Okay, that would be great. Uh, just briefly, uh, the Police Executive Research Forum, which was one of the three. Uh, large think tanks around uh, law enforcement and policing in the United States uh, had started to work on a uh, essentially a residency program. So mirroring the medical training model um, for law enforcement. And it didn't catch on a few years ago. But as we explore uh, alternative training methodologies, that is one of the things that is on the list. Um, and there's a, a wide array of things. But Basically, how do you look at other immersive learning environments and how do we mirror more closely some of the best practice that exists outside of government in those immersive environments to train our folks going forward? Uh, it could take the form of you go to the academy for a period of time, maybe not 16 weeks in a row, maybe it's just to get some basics, and then you go into the field as a resident or an intern or whatever you call it, and then you come back and you get some more uh, training, and then we send you into the field at a uh, at a basic level to do certain things, and then you come back uh, to learn more. Um, I, I'm very comfortable saying that the model we use now of um, drinking from a fire hose for 16 plus weeks is not a contemporary adult learning environment. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 I just to. I didn't mean to imply here that um, only rural people should go to a more urban area, but maybe, no. maybe Vice the person. cops, yeah, maybe the cops from Burlington should go to Essex someday, to, not Essex, Vermont, but at Essex County, to see how yeah. the, the difference in culture there than from an urban community. So I don't know, but that's very interesting, Commissioner. Thank you. You know, I, if I can add one other, another yeah, thing is that I think part of the challenge that, that, that we've had is that we don't see how implicit bias is woven through the curriculum at the academy, whether it's fire abuse, whether it's, you know, um, use of force, whether it's traffic stops, whether it's, I mean, I, it's it, it's it is difficult for us to detect where in the curriculum that manifests itself. Now we know post basic for state police that, that and we know that the um, that supervision at state police reinforces and reminds troopers of implicit bias in a way that that other departments don't. Um, so if you don't have the supervision, you know, once you leave the academy, then you're apt to lose whatever, whatever little bit you might have gained there. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that that, oh, go ahead. 
I think that that's one of the things that um, Commissioner Sherling had in his when he wrote up the thing on training and supervision and promotion is that we need to make sure that we're promote, promoting leaders who yeah. actually have the qualities that we want to be leading and supervising. Right. But if the council is left on its own, yeah, that's not gonna happen. To go back to your first point. Right, to go back to my first point. Mm -hmm. Which is, there isn't over, there isn't no one, the council reports to no one. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about this in the past. I feel maybe even with you, Curtis, but I mean, we, it, it, it is just curious why it is not under the umbrella of public safety. Right. It's only 17 years I've been talking about this. Yeah. Well, how many times does it have to be repeated <laughs> before we hear the sermon? Right. So, Commissioner, do we need an agency of public safety? Yeah. Is that rhetorical, Madam Chair? It was. <laughs> but we'd love your... It was because it's not going to happen this year, as we know. It, it, uh, I, I would just call out uh, Curtis that uh, he's only been at it for a short time. The first study on this was 1974. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but maybe next year, you know, this could be first on, on the deck for consideration in 2021, whoever is here to do it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and uh, you know, while uh, you have given me a microphone briefly, I, I should just say there is value in a representative council that helps to guide training. Uh, it, it's important not to be dismissive of the great work that has happened over the years and the people putting effort into that. It's, uh, it's really modernizing, as we keep saying, and finding the right role for the council but with requisite oversight um, added to this model as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, yes, I, I agree. I think that, um, and, but, should it live someplace, even with a uh, with a council, should it live someplace? And I don't know if the executive branch is the right place. Maybe it should live at Vermont Technical College. I don't know where it should live. Allison? Uh, may I go back to a question Curtis asked? Um, and, and if Mark is still on the line, I'd love to have Mark or Michael answer it, whoever knows the answer, but is how is implicit bias woven into the academy's curriculum. How how is something that basic uh, woven in everywhere? And is there an attempt to weave it in to every aspect of training? You mean the recognition of implicit bias? It, it, yes, Not, because it it has such yeah no in, yeah that's my question. I mean, I'd like to go back. I, I I think Curtis asked a good question, which I think we need an answer to. I will have to uh, defer the nuances of that. Uh, while it feels like I've been back for seven years, it only has been uh, seven or eight months. And uh, so I was detached for a few years and I'm probably not fully up to speed on exactly how it's woven in right now. So I'd probably give you some misinformation. Because at this particular point in our life, in our world, I think that's one of the immediate questions we need to have a better understanding of. I think that that's a, a fair question to ask, and uh, the the difficulty in answering it is that the academy relies on uh, an extremely large cadre of instructors with different uh, segmentations and subsets of what their curriculums are. So to speak to 800 hours worth of how is it woven in uh, is difficult. I teach uh, for the academy. I'm the, the master instructor for uh, radar and uh, LIDAR speed measuring devices. Uh, so how is it built in? We talk about race data collection. We talk about uh, how we interact with people. We talk about our, our purposes for speed enforcement, which uh, in a, a very short nutshell, it's to reduce motor vehicle crashes and fatalities on Vermont highways. Uh, so we, um, I think through the uh, legislative mandate for uh, fair and impartial policing training, uh, through the, the academy's delivery of that, uh, we're starting to see uh, the cultural shift 
uh, of law enforcement. I mean, it usually takes eight to 10 years for any organization's culture to change. And that law has been in place for about six. So I think you're starting to see the curriculums update uh, as you see the cultural shift. Now, is it enough uh, to the commissioner's statement? Uh, we're on the football field somewhere. We're certainly not where Minnesota is. We're certainly not at the finish line and we need to speed up. Uh, I agree that uh, there's probably more that can be done. I also think that as uh, old instructors phase out, new instructors phase in, we'll start to see new ideas coming that recognize that uh, old practices need to go by the wayside. And that is part of the cultural shift. Uh, so. Uh, that's the best I can do to speak to it, I think. That, that goes to the recruiting of all those different instructors. I mean, because that goes to the, the, the core value of every instructor you hire. Yeah. It does, but there's also a, a bit of a nuance uh, and yeah. I'm I often feel like a minority of this conversation. Uh, however, the, uh, the academy's instructors are, are very high up there from agencies. So uh, it looks like I lost you. Can you no, hear we heard your last statement there. And I think that what Mark is saying is that the, um, we don't hire all the, the instructors at the academy. There are only a couple core instructors there. And the others are on loan from state police or sheriff's offices or municipal police departments, wherever there's that expertise. So. Um, we, we need to rely on that very particular expertise um, for Mark does some training. Keith Clark used to do a lot of mental health training at the academy. Um, there are people who do um, different types of training, but we don't hire them. We rely that, on. Yeah. Huh? Well, that, that may be an issue. I mean, that it, we rely It probably on. is, but, and yeah. we could, and, if we, if we went out decided that we were gonna go out and hire all the instructors, um, that would never get past the appropriations committee. No, I, I understand that, but I, I think, yeah. Anyway. I, and I, I have to say, I applaud your optimism, Mark, in thinking that it will be eight to 10 years in culture change. I was thinking you were gonna say eight to 10 generations because for me, this is such a, a, a long-term project that it, it is, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're optimistic about eight to 10 years. And, and if you look at acceptance of, of, of cultural changes we've made just in my lifetime in the legislature, same-sex marriage, uh, uh, marriage equity, I mean, I have hope too, but uh, on this, we have been struggling for so long. Well, if you, part of, part of it is, um, because what Curtis was saying at the very beginning, and he said 50 different agencies, there are actually 82 different oh, there are. law enforcement agencies out there. I think that, isn't that what we came up with when we yeah, looked at it? There are, um, and, the, and the Vermont State Police have gotten along farther because they're one entity. Of the yeah. others, there is nobody that, sits over them or that uh, they report to, except to their own local um, select boards or um, county voters. So it, it's the way we have law enforcement organized in this state makes it very difficult to, to do those um, uniform kinds of, and, and to make sure that we're, we're gaining ground. But I think that, um, with with the state police, um, I think that once they put certain people in certain positions and had an advisory um, council, I think that the culture um, it did not yeah. it was rather rapid. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, just uh, extension wait, of point, if you will. Julio has a. I, I'm happy to wait for, for the sheriff to speak and then I'll uh, okay I'll go. All right, Mark. I will, I will be I will be brief. Uh, uh, another thing I, I just want to point out is that uh, when we talk about the state police and a lot of the progress they've made, uh, it's actually it's been extremely helpful in some ways because a path paved is one that's easier to easier to follow. The hard thing is is, is that most of us lack the resources uh, to do what they've done. Uh, I mean. 
Captain Scott do, has done a tremendous job uh, with fair and impartial policing. And I can't even have a person who's solely responsible for internal investigations. I need to have him uh, responsible for 15 other things as well. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Julio? So, just a, a, a to respond to a number of points that have been made in the last few minutes um, uh, and maybe taking them in reverse order in terms of a civilian based accountability mechanism that centralized um, uh, at least with respect to allegations of biased police conduct, whether that's a biased stop, a search or a biased use of force, for example, a biased arrest. All of those are currently and, and have for many years been subject to the investigative authority of the Human Rights Commission, right. which has an independent board of commissioners for every single police department in the state, that's state or local. Um, and they have the ability to take uh, departments to court. Um, uh, so, so there is that. I mean, there is that. There are other types of police misconduct because an unbiased but unlawful search is still a constitutional violation, um, a Fourth Amendment violation. So there, are, there, are, there is an area that, um, that isn't addressed. But the issue of bias, which I think prompted a lot of that, is at least in the short term something that can be addressable by the Human Rights Commission. That's, um, that's always been the case, or at least since I've been in Vermont, uh, since 2004. Um, on the issue about uh, the training, I wanted uh, to support the comments that I've heard from uh, the committee and also um, from Commissioner Sherling about this sort of residency idea or something like that. Uh, right, you began by saying you didn't know if you thought it was a you know, a crazy idea to have more contact with people. Well, there's a really ri rich literature in the field of psychology called the contact hypothesis that is exactly about that, that you can reduce or you can see progress in reducing bias by having more contact with people who are different than you. Um, and some agencies have done a number of things like a residency program or in, a, in, in larger settings, foot patrols, requiring the officers to get out of their car um, and pop them down in a neighborhood. Um, famously, Cam Camden County, New Jersey, which has been all over the newspapers in the last couple of weeks as an example of a police department that really turned its way around and its former chief is the current president of, of PERF, the Police Executive Research Forum, Scott Thompson. He had, when he became chief, he dropped his officers in neighborhoods, not in commercial areas, and dropped them in the neighborhoods and said, we'll pick you up at the end of your shift. The officers, he said, said, well, where do we go to the bathroom? And he said, well, you better make some friends because uh, that's the only way you're gonna get, be able to get to use the bathroom. So. Contact theory, I think, is, is very viable. More experiential based learning, uh, that's the fire hose issue. I teach hate crimes at the academy. Uh, I have since 2009. When I took over that program, it was death by PowerPoint. It was over 70 PowerPoint slides and, and a video. Um, and it was something that we really had to make much more interactive, but experiential learning is the way to go and related to the issue of training, something that hasn't been mentioned that I think is really important. And if folks contact other civilian review folks or, or, or NACOL, you'll hear it from them. And it's really an essential ingredient for fully effective and, and confidence building civilian input review or whatever you call it, is to have some basis for training for those individuals so that they understand at least the basics of search and seizure the basics of the state police policy. It's pretty well documented that in terms of community dissatisfaction with those, when you have an individuals who are volunteers who meet once a month and then they review a case, but if there's no one who is either you know, on staff who can work up the cases for them in a way a law clerk might work up a case for a judge, or if they don't have training, then there are concerns that they go one way or the other, either they uh, seek unrealistic expectations on the police, maybe because they're holding a standard that doesn't match the constitutional standard, and then they're, therefore they lose credibility with the law enforcement community or, or the, the professionals there. Or on the other side, they become too deferential to the department, and the department says, oh no, 
when we arrest somebody, we can go through all of their, you know, their entire cell phone contents, even though um, people who are, you know, current in the field know that Supreme Court says you can't do that. Generally speaking, when you seize a phone, you have to have reason to get into the phone. So, I mean, having something like either resources or requirement, some places have, and, and NACOL sometimes provide a civilian academy where your, uh, your non-professionals in, in this area can get acquainted so that they become better issue spotters so that they can sort out the, the different opinions more competently because it's competent civilian review uh, uh, that creates the confidence, not just the existence of uh, right. you know. That's all I had. Anything else? Anybody have anything to add here? Are you talking to me? <laughs> Who's this? <laughs> Um, I, I, I think we've heard some great, wonderful uh, ideas, actually, and all, all good things. I'd love to be able to implement them all immediately. I think okay. of all the students that have gone all over the world through AFS or, or whatever, that builds cultural awareness and, 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 and empathy for the other in a way that, all, you know, that, you know, it's just so rich and that we could employ that same experience opportunity. No, you guys are going to be there for a long time. <laughs> Sorry, Miss. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. All right. All right, yeah, let's just wrap it up. So, um, I don't know how we employ that here, but it is a, an idea that we should consider. Um, well, somebody might be interested in, in actually financing that. That's something that I can see the community, Vermont Community Foundation being very interested in as we do this work of uh, addressing uh, the challenges in law enforcement. Uh, and I, I can see that somebody would be very interested in helping finance that. Well, we'll look into that. So where are we committee? Um, it's getting very hot and steamy in my area of the state. It's glorious here and now the Zoom is back. <laughs> I know. I, I think we've heard a lot of good things today. It was a good conversation. So what I, tomorrow I think we'll just kind of um, do a general hear from anybody that wants to talk about any of the issues that we have. Um, not just focus on, um, and then on Thursday and Friday, try to wrap it up and put some ideas into a form. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah, it does. Um, it, it, Curtis, I'm just curious, have you weighed in on, on the other areas that we have been addressing in, in government operations? I know you've been to the Senate Judiciary. Um, no, I, I've not weighed in on, on the others. The, what we did before was improper conduct and we have yeah. that and but we could do we could if you're interested we could do that tomorrow too because we can just do a kind of a general overview from people and just ask people to weigh in on issues that are of concern to them and um suggestions if that makes sense sure okay all right gail sure. i wanted to let you know that lauren hibbert got yep. back to us with language. I'm not sure if you've seen that in your email. And no, you take it we're up. paying attention. We're not reading our email. We're paying attention to our conversation. I did see that she sent an email. So if we, um, uh, can, can we shift? Yeah, let's do it now and not do it during lunch or some other time if, if, if people are willing. I think right. let's copy diem. Would you I like think me that, to ask uh, Lauren to step back into the meeting? Yes, if you okay. would, that would be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So does that make sense to tomorrow to do just kind of general invite people and hear what concerns are that we haven't addressed at all? 
let people weigh in on anything they want to weigh in on. And we'll do it more kind of like um, testimony instead of just a lot of back and forth, because we'll just ask people to, and we can have back and forth, but we can um, just hear from people. Does that make sense? Because I'm concerned that we, we need to make sure that we hear from what people's concerns are out there that we may not have addressed at all. Sure. Yes. Yep. I think okay. that's good because we actually haven't heard from too wide a, as many people as we might. So that's good. Okay. All right. So then with that, thank you, Curtis. And you certainly are welcome to stay. And everybody else is welcome to stay with us. We love having people with us. But um, we're going to look at the ability of pharmacists to give vaccines. And and so, so by I mean, COVID, congratulations again.